And welcome to Brussels for this very special edition of Talking Europe, where I'm joined here at the Berlaymont headquarters of the European Commission by the President of the EU Commission, José Manuel Barroso. Mr. Barroso, thank you very much for having us here at uh, the Berlaymont in Brussels. I remind our viewers that you're a former centre-right Prime Minister of Portugal. You were chosen by your peers in 2004 to chair the EU uh, executive. You then won a second term in 2009. That coincided, of course, with the deepest financial and economic crisis Europe uh, has seen in generations. And your successor uh, will take over, Jean-Claude Juncker from Luxembourg. Now, we'll look back at your 10 years at the top of Europe. We're going to look at the challenges as well. The first question won't come from, from me, but from our partner, Ashusse, Europe's uh, uh, leading business school. Noël Lenoir has a question for you. Let's Listen to her. Dear Manuel Barroso, if you had to remember only one thing, what is the achievement you are the most proud of? And second question, in retrospect, what project would you have liked to be able to launch now before the end of your term? Your biggest achievement, your biggest regret? Biggest achievement, the fact that you were able to keep Europe united and open during the most serious economic crisis since the beginning of the European integration. Not only we were able to resist to the crisis, showing our resilience. In fact, uh, uh, many people were predicting the implosion of the euro, and we have shown that will not happen. But also, at the same time, we were open. In 2004, we were only uh, 15. Now, we are 28 countries, so we have shown that uh, it was possible to Europe almost to double uh, the number of its members in this very deep uh, crisis. So I think the greatest achievement was to show the resilience of Europe. The regret. Uh, I would have liked, of course, the response to the crisis to be stronger and quicker. At the same time, we have to understand that the Commission uh, does not take its decisions alone. We take the initiative, but afterwards the governments, we need the support of the governments and also of the European Parliament. And the governments, because we are democracies, they were not always in agreement. It was very difficult sometimes to bring a consensus. And so it is not possible to have decisions like we have, for instance, when you are a prime minister, as I was before, in one country. The European Union is a union of today 28 democracies. And the, the rhythm of democracies is not so quick sometimes as we would like them, like it to be. You look back at the height of the crisis, 2009, 2010, 2011. Was there a moment when you thought, we're not going to make this? This is going to be a disaster. I'm not going to save Europe. Uh, there were very dramatic moments. I personally, I was always confident that we are going to overcome the difficulties. But if you want one moment where I thought we were very clear uh, in danger, uh, one of the most dramatic was the Cannes G20 in some summit. In the margins of that, there was... 11. 11. The world because was watching and wondering yeah. where the hell are we yeah. going? Because let's not forget at that time, we had not only the concerns regarding Greece, because of the announcement of a referendum and the markets were completely in panic. But we had panic also about Spain and about Italy. There were, in fact, some proposals made in the margins of G20 to put Italy under a full program of the IMF, which, in my opinion, will be a disaster because it will not, one of the biggest economies in the world that it is Italy, uh, it will send a very bad message to the markets worldwide about what situation is the euro area in. And so I think we were avoided that. Uh, that was very close to the abyss, very close to the disaster. But I personally uh, believe that it was possible, because I know the European Union, how it works, it was possible at the end to come to a consensus between the member states. But in fact, it takes time uh, to bridge sometimes differences between uh, so different perspectives. You often hear that it takes a real crisis to test the leadership, yeah. the qualities of, of leaders. When you think back at that period, you were sat in front of uh, 27 heads of state and government. Did some of them lose their nerves? 
<laughs> yes, there were very dramatic moments. Not only when we had discussions in the European Council uh, with the 27 heads of government, but also sometimes in uh, small groups to prepare some, some decisions. Let's not forget that there are some differences in the economic or financial culture of our countries. It's not just the difference between Finland and Greece. What it's about Merkozy? Voilà. Nicolas Sarkozy and Angela voilà. Merkel. Voilà, this is precisely one of the points. France and Germany. Were there a lot of arguments? A lot of arguments, a lot of enthusiasm. But at the end, I was happy to see that they were able, France and Germany, to come to a, a joint position. Nicolas Sarkozy likes to say back in France that he's the savior of Europe. He says, without my energy, without my charisma, the Eurozone would have collapsed. I will not say about one or other leader. Uh, what I can say is that in general, without a strong European commitment of many of us that have worked for that, in fact, the collapse of the euro could have happened. But uh, I personally believe that this was not the, the work of a man or a woman. It was the work of the institutions together with the governments of Europe. The problem, some say, is the ideology that prevailed at the time and still prevails today, an ideology inspired by Germany. The thinking is that the response to the crisis is budget cuts, structural reforms and very little uh, public uh, spending. Is Germany guilty for what is going on today in southern Europe, in your country, Portugal, in Greece, in Spain? Uh, I really think this is not the case. It was not Germany that created the problems for Greece or for Portugal. Uh, I think it's better for each country to make assessment what they have done wrong themselves. The financial crisis was a result of irresponsible uh, behaviour in the private sector, namely the financial sector, with the very big bubbles. Uh, in, by the way, in the United States, not only in Europe, or not only in the European Union. Look, Iceland is not a member of the European Union, and they literally went bankrupt. This was the result of irresponsible uh, private behaviour, namely in the financial sector, and irresponsible behaviour of the governments accumulating excessive but public debt. There so we cannot at, say it was the fault of Germany. We're frankly. looking at the cause of yes, the disease. Exactly. When we look at the treatment, I'm not mm. the only one saying this, the IMF, the United States have been telling you, look, without support for growth, you're hitting the wall. But we are in favour of growth, and at least the Commission has always defended more investment, structural reforms and, of course, fiscal consolidation for you the countries that need to do it. don't have the money to put this in place from the member states. Um, I would like to have more, but uh, once again, we need the support of our countries to do that. And I think, uh, I think it will be better to try to spend the money we have, because there is a lot of money in our budget that is not even spent because of problems of implementation at the uh, national uh, level. So I really believe it's not uh, appropriate now to try to put the blame on one country uh, for what happened uh, in other countries. What we need to do now is everyone to look at what the country or the institution can do. Uh, and this is uh, what we should now concentrate on. You mentioned a very flamboyant uh, French president, a very cautious German uh, chancellor, and there's David Cameron. If there's one country where uh, people have always had, let's say, mixed feelings about Europe, it has to be the United Kingdom, where the British Prime Minister wants to put uh, the EU membership question uh, to the public in an in-out referendum. Is David Cameron playing with fire? First of all, it's the right uh, that the government uh, or the people of any country has. Uh, nobody is um, forced to be in the European Union. The European Union is a free um, association of countries that created common institutions. Um, I respect that. Now, in fact, it's a little bit uh, playing with fire when it comes to some kind of comments regarding the European Union, because you cannot criticize the European Union uh, from uh, Monday to, to Saturday and ask people to vote for the European Union on Sunday. Uh, we already saw this, uh, for instance, when there was discussion about the constitutional treaty. Some governments that were criticizing Europe, and probably not even so much as the leadership in Britain does, 
and afterwards uh, they got a negative response, of course, from the citizens. So you're telling us that uh, David Cameron's, uh, let's put it this way, uh, negative narrative is actually fueling Euroscepticism in Britain, is helping uh, parties like UKIP. I mean, certainly it's not helping the support Europe when systematically you uh, convey a negative message uh, about Europe, it's only natural that more people uh, embrace the Eurosceptic message. And for me, it's not a surprise that a, a party like UKIP is growing because we have not seen from the mainstream political forces su sufficient support, arguments and also conviction regarding uh, the European Union. Back uh, in France, I'd like to talk about uh, the audition of the hearing of the French Commission, uh, but more generally, the hearings we're seeing these days in the European Parliament. It's been very tough for a number of uh, commissioners designate. Were you expecting these hearings to be uh, so dramatic? I was, because I know that the European Parliament is a very assertive in these occasions. I went through this process twice uh, to get my commission uh, voted twice and afterwards approved. So it's a democratic right the European Parliament has, uh, but it's especially difficult because the Parliament, there are very different, let's say, political forces. And so for a uh, commissioner designates to make uh, a consensus uh, is, of course, uh, very challenging. Do you believe that the Commission will be confirmed by yes. the European Parliament? Oh yes, I'm sure it will be. Uh, now, some in France believe there is a, a growing feeling of uh, uh, anti-French sentiment here in Brussels. Uh, we saw it during the hearing, apparently, of uh, Pierre Moscovici. Uh, France is constantly being criticised for being the sick man of Europe. Do you believe that there is a problem with France at the moment here in Brussels? No, not in Brussels. Uh, we try to, to deal with all our governments uh, in a very objective uh, way. And uh, when it comes to France, let's be honest, it's one of the most important countries. It's an indispensable member of the European Union. It's at the centre of the European Union. I already said it to several leaders in France that it is the only country that is at the same time the north and the south of Europe. So it's, it's at the centre, at the core of the European Union. We cannot conceive the European Union without France. No, there is a great admiration for what France is as a country. Of course, now what there is in France, it's a problem. It's a problem with growth. Uh, but that, uh, that problem that exists in France has not the same kind of dimension in other uh, countries of Europe. So I think it's fair for the French to see what went wrong. Why uh, France is not growing as other countries, uh, why did it happen? But this is not because of the European Commission, it's because of France itself. The European Commission uh, is likely to reject uh, France's draft budget proposal. Uh, we know that the Fr that's what we hear from some uh, EU uh, officials. Yeah. You tell us uh, whether that's true. But in France, it's really being perceived uh, as a sort of uh, diktat from Brussels. Well, what is your message to the French first government? First of all, I cannot speak about the new budget because I have not yet seen it. So the European Commission cannot uh, define a position concerning a budget that we have not yet seen. Uh, but first of all, I want to make it clear, there is no diktat regarding uh, France or any other country. The European Commission has simple, simply to implement the rules and the commitments taken by the governments themselves. So the governments, they have accepted some commitments in terms of uh, uh, the budget. And these are uh, in the treaty, they are in legislation, and they themselves assumed to the other governments some commitments. And they have asked the European Commission as an independent institution to check if this is done or not. So it's not the Commission that takes these decisions. It is, of course, the member states that have accepted and they have took a decision regarding the stability and growth pact, and the Commission has simply to implement what was decided by the, the governments of Europe. And regarding France, look, uh, we have already proposed uh, at least two years more for France to uh, come to the, uh, uh, some objectives in terms of the deficit. So, I mean, France cannot complain about uh, uh, the European Commission. On the contrary, we have always shown that we are very objective and we try to accommodate uh, uh, the legitimate concerns of all our uh, governments. And one word, if you allow, 
on Ukraine because Europe has been uh, very instrumental in trying to bring Ukraine closer uh, to uh, Europe, closer to the European Union. Uh, we saw what happened uh, following the uh, pro-EU protest in November last year in Kiev. Is Europe partly responsible for the chaos that followed? No. Responsible uh, are those who have created the chaos. And not not exactly Europe. in your I mean, view. It was Russia, of course. Russia did not accept uh, the free decisions of the Ukrainian people. We were not trying to bring Ukraine against their will to closer to the European Union. It were different governments of Ukraine. I've been working with them these last 10 years. Different governments that asked to become closer to the European Union. They have even asked for membership of the European Union. And what happened was that the government of Ukraine, previous government of Ukraine that has um, uh, uh, initialed the agreement with the European Union, that was an agreement that was negotiated for five years. At the end, it was, it, the government was prevented to sign it because of Russian pressure. And afterwards, Russian was even saying that they could not ratify it. Uh, this is not acceptable because Ukraine is an independent and sovereign country. And looking at the situation on the ground, uh, I guess you will tell us it's too early uh, to... Uh, lift the sanctions that have been implemented against uh, the country, uh, against so, Russia. In fact, we need to see the consolidation of the ceasefire. Uh, there is no interest in Europe uh, to keep the sanctions for, for themselves. I mean, we, we want, I repeat, we want to have as much as possible a normal and, if possible, a good relationship with Russia. But there are questions of principle that we cannot accept. And the sanctions were a way of showing to the leadership in Russia that, in fact, this behavior was not acceptable. So I wish the conditions are there as soon as possible for us to come back to uh, business as usual uh, with, with Russia. But uh, we need to see the consolidation of these conditions. Thank you very much for having shared your thoughts with us on France 24 today. We were, of course, at the uh, European Commission at the Berlimont in Brussels. It's time to go back to Paris now for more news on France 24.